All right. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me here. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, I've uh, uh, basically decided that I'm going to take a different uh, direction to most of the other talks and talk about how to uh, do uh, bottom-up biophysical modeling of diseases uh, using imaging data as uh, the empirical evidence, but not really doing much with voxel-level data itself. I, uh, un up until December, I was uh, here, uh, and I moved to here uh, about uh, four months ago. Uh, what uh, my lab is trying to do is kind of be at the interface of uh, neuroimaging and computational neurology, um, where uh, this is a forward-looking statement. We want to combine machine learning with bottom-up modeling uh, of uh, neuroanatomy uh, and so on, um, and come up with something that can kind of uh, go beyond images. And uh, uh, this talk uh, basically is, is going to be all about brain images and brain diseases, uh, just because that happens to be my current interest. But I hope that uh, the, the learnings from here would be applicable to other diseases, uh, cancer, and so on. Uh, what I want to talk about today is mainly uh, about networks and graphs. And the reason is that they're everywhere. Um, and uh, I'll focus on networks and graphs from the brain, because uh, this is really a, a very exciting field these days, uh, knowing that uh, the brain is a very massively interconnected network. Uh, the ability to extract these networks has recently become available. And therefore, now we're in a really good position to use these networks and apply what we know about how graphs work and what we can do with graphs to, uh, to, uh, to kind of model diseases. And uh, here's the, the basic concept here. You, you take images from the brain. Uh, you identify quantitative imaging biomarkers. And a lot of this voxel-level uh, analysis was discussed over the last couple of days here. But when you have that, say you do segmentation, you do uh, feature uh, extraction. Um, what do you do with that? Um, you could stop there, and the radiologist would be perfectly happy if you stopped right there. But um, if you are a modeler of, uh, of, of biological systems, you want to use that information to, do, uh, uh, to understand what disease does. And so in the context of the brain, one of the first things we want to do is to extract networks from the brain. We want to kind of discretize vo voxel-level data onto a graph, and then use the graph itself to do mathematical modeling for various applications like predictions to guide treatment, therapy, prevention, and so on. So what is a brain network? Uh, uh, we usually talk about uh, two types of brain network. A structural network, which is basically the white matter fibers connecting various parts of the gray matter. Uh, uh, and um, functional networks, which are basically statistical artifacts, where you look at signals coming from different parts of the brain, and their co-occurrence or co correlation uh, gives you a sense that these two regions must be connected, if they're uh, functionally connected, if they're activating together. So I'll uh, rush through this uh, in a bit of a hurry uh, because I want to get to the modeling stuff, but. Um, uh, you can obtain these kinds of networks now from in vivo imaging data. Uh, MRI, structural MRI, diffusion weighted MRI, uh, functional bold MRI, and even magnetoencephalography. These are mature fields now, uh, and I just described uh, the functional network. Uh, you can obtain functional networks from fMRI, but also from things like magnetoencephalography, where you put a bunch of electrodes on the scalp, do source reconstruction to understand where the signal is coming from, and then exactly correlate uh, re, uh, different parts of the brain, signals from different parts of the brain to obtain connectivity, function connectivity networks. And uh, an example of this is shown here where people found that different parts of the brain uh, seem to be uh, belonging to two different anti-correlated networks that did different things at different times. This is from MEG data. Just an example. Um, to obtain structural networks, uh, you need to know the physical wiring of the brain. Uh, and up until recently, this was not possible uh, in vivo. But with uh, diffusion-weighted MRI, uh, uh, we are now able to do this. So what diffusion MRI does, and I'm sure uh, Dugu described this yesterday, so we'll belabor it. Uh, it basically measures the propensity of water molecules trapped within brain tissue uh, 
to diffuse in one direction or another. And once you know the directional preference of diffusion, you can infer that there was a fiber bundle there because uh, water doesn't like to diffuse across fibers, it likes to diffuse along them. Uh, the basic uh, uh, acquisition strategy is, uh, is, is that you create diffusion weighted gradients uh, and uh, uh, you apply different directional gradients and obtain different diffusion MRI images and you process them, um, you acquire uh, directions at various uh, points on a unit sphere. And when you have all those a acquisitions, you use an, uh, a reconstruction algorithm to reconstruct that thing on the right, which is what we're interested in. Called, we call it the fiber orientation distribution function, which tells you approximately what directions a water molecule would like to take in that voxel. Uh, and those things are really useful because they tell you uh, about the underlying fiber structure in the brain. And here is an example uh, where you see that the green blob uh, denotes that there is probably a, uh, you know, forward to backward, the front to back fiber in that part of the brain tissue. You take a bunch of these uh, ODFs and you string them together and using computational tractography algorithms, you get basically get this, which we call a whole brain tractogram. Uh, this actually happens to be my own brain, uh, so you notice how beautiful it is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's great, but we can't do math on that. So what we want to do is take it from a tractogram to the connectome, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. So you take diffusion MRI, structural MRI, co-register on top of each other, parcelate the structural MRI into gray and white, parcelate the gray matter into various regions of interest. You seed them uh, and do tractography and basically count how many streamlines go from one region to another. And that gives you a graph shown at the bottom. Again, what we've done is we've abstracted this tractography data set into a mathematical object where nodes of the graph represent brain regions and their connections are weighted depending on how many fiber streamlines went from A to B. And that basically uh, can be represented by this uh, adjacency or connectivity matrix shown here, C, uh, where uh, rows and columns are brain regions. The first thing to know about these connectomes is that disease changes these patterns. And here's an example uh, of, of what would happen in, uh, let me see. This is in temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, and again, it's, I'm sure it's impossible for you to see how they're different. But small differences in the connectivity uh, matrix uh, can have a pretty large impact on what the disease does to the brain. Uh, and one of the first things we want to do is to use graph models to model how disease affects uh, the brain. And here's an example of what you would do if you had a stroke in a certain part of the brain. So we know that the same kind of stroke lesion in one part of the brain can have a completely different effect if it was in a different part of the brain. And that makes sense to us intuitively because different parts of the brain are diff doing different things. Uh, but here's a way to deal with this mathematically where uh, you computationally lesion out all the streamlines that pass through the, stro uh, the stroke lesion. And that tells you which parts of the brain there you were going to connect to but didn't because of the stroke. And when you do that, you can come up with these uh, projections of the lesion out to the gray matter. And, and, and that's shown on the right. Um, and it turns out that these projections, which we call uh, uh, change in connectivity scores, uh, uh, are much better correlated with functional outcomes than the lesions themselves. So that's an example of what you could do if you knew connectivity and the connectome. So this is uh, what I really want to focus on today. Uh, how do we develop models of network spread? Because everything on in the brain is really a process of spread on the network. Uh, and what do we do with that? I'm going to start with neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, Parkinson's, where it has been known for a long time that these diseases are, are highly stereotyped person after person after person. You see, if you have early memory disease, you start with the mesial temporal lobe, spreads to the temporal areas, uh, parietal frontal, in approximately the same pattern. And now we know that these are because uh, uh, the, the underlying pathology happens to travel along these network connections and go f and skip from neuron to neuron uh, by means that we, by, by methods we don't quite understand but there's a lot of animal imaging data and, and studies and s 
apologize for the font there, but uh, they were supposed to tell you about some papers that, <laughs> uh, that describe this. Um, so knowing that that is what's going on, uh, as a graph theory person, you would know automatically that you can model that if you knew the structural connectivity of the brain. And this is what we tried to do. This was several years ago now, where we uh, came up with a network diffusion model of the spread of dementia within the brain. And the idea was to replicate what happens uh, from pathology scans, uh, pathology uh, data sets, where we know that the, the pathology is highly stereotyped. In order to do this, uh, we have a whole pipeline where we take uh, um, MRI, um, uh, uh, structural MRI from patients, we compute uh, regional atrophy measures, we co-register that on top of the, the tractography data, and therefore what I'm showing on the right is, is, is meant to suggest that atrophy patterns for a brain region are, are basically, brain regions are coincident with graph nodes. So the nodes of the graph have atrophy values and connections come from DTI, tractography. So now we're ready to do some uh, graph theory modeling where we assume that the signal X is basically the concentration of the pathology uh, and we say, all right, if you start with region one and it's connected to region two, uh, how would it spread to the second region? And, and to do that, we thought that the simplest way to do it was to model it with uh, classical diffusion, where, which follows just two rules, that the rate of diffusion depends on the concentration gradient between regions and also the fatness of the pipe, which is exactly what the connectivity is between two regions. So on the top, I'm showing you the first order diffusion equation, which you know, is uh, laughably simple. Uh, but when you stack it up on the whole network, you can write it as a vector value first order differential equation, now involving the graph Laplace and H. And it turns out, obviously, because first order, um, it has a closed form solution. Uh, so if you knew an initial pattern X0, you could predict all future patterns of spread uh, via its operation uh, with uh, what we call the diffusion kernel, the exponential matrix exponentiation shown there. Uh, and this is kind of incredible because in, in biophysics, it's almost impossible to obtain closed form solutions for anything. So when you see that, you kind of have to celebrate a little bit. Uh, so in any case, uh, we know that this, this is not a new thing. Uh, it has been known as the graph heat equation for a long time. Uh, and because it, the kernel involves matrix exponentiation, you would evaluate it typically using the eigen decomposition of the Laplacian. Uh, and so what you will see is that because the Laplacian eigenvalues range from zero to one, uh, the, and because they are weighted by uh, the ex negative exponentiation of the eigenvalues, the large eigenvalues would die away quickly, which means that the summation that tells you what you would see in the future would be dominated by only the first two or three eigenmodes, eigenvectors of this Laplacian. Uh, so to test this, uh, we first uh, started with the hippocampus, which is one of the earliest affected areas in Alzheimer's disease, and let the graph diffusion process play out. And that's shown on the top row, and you see that it more or less recapitulates the spatial temporal progression of Alzheimer's disease as we know. Um, to test the other um, uh, prediction that the, low, the small eigenmodes of the Laplacian would recapitulate disease, what I'm showing you here is an example where the second eigenmode of the graph, Laplacian, which is the first non-zero eigenmode, um, seems to be very well, uh, well, seems to resemble the pattern of atrophy from Alzheimer's patients, shown at the bottom. Um, a word about the rendering here, the, the, the spheres represent brain regions, and their uh, uh, diameter represents how uh, big the uh, atrophy or the eigenvalue there is, eigenvector there is, and they're color-coded by lobes, so a neuroanatomist can see, okay, the reds are temporal lobe, the cyan is subcortical, uh, blue is frontal, and so on. We asked what you would see if you took the, the second uh, non-zero eigenmode, the third, this, uh, number three, and what we found was that it actually looks very much like the second most prevalent dementia uh, after Alzheimer's, which is frontotemporal dementia. Now, these are striking results because the top row of the, are just models coming from healthy connectomes, no disease, and the bottom comes from the atrophy pattern of uh, 
uh, uh, various patients. So we took this a little further in the last, uh, well, actually earlier this year, uh, uh, we, we crunched a whole bunch of Alzheimer's data from the ADNI study, and we were able to show that if you start, in this case, the interrhinal cortex, which is where tile pathology in Alzheimer's first starts, we're able to recapitulate very nicely the spatiotemporal progression of, um, of Alzheimer's, and it seems to match very well with the atrophy pattern shown on the right. Because the model doesn't care about what is spreading, it is equally applicable to other uh, pathologies like Parkinson's disease, where it's not amyloid or tau that's spreading, but another uh, protein called alpha-synuclein. Uh, and here, this is an example showing what happens if you see the substantia nigra, which is one of the earliest affected uh, uh, regions in Parkinson's brains. And what happens if you play out the network diffusion model, uh, and you see that it, at some point, it starts resembling quite nicely the empirical uh, Parkinson's atrophy pattern from a very, a very large uh, public uh, uh, Parkinson's data set called PPMI. And that's great. Uh, but we also want to uh, dive deeper in and try to understand whether the fact that network transmission, network diffusion can explain these patterns doesn't mean that there aren't other factors that can also explain these patterns. One that people talk about is called selective vulnerability. The idea that different parts of the brain are selectively vulnerable to different uh, degenerating pathologies, uh, uh, like hippocampus in Alzheimer's and substantia nigra in Parkinson's. So we asked the question whether if you use the innate healthy gene expression patterns from different parts of the brain and use that as a surrogate for whatever molecular factors are responsible for making some regions selectively vulnerable, uh, if you add that to a, 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 a linear model, a statistical model, along with the network diffusion prediction, which one would win? And the idea is we want to see uh, the pattern, which, which is the best correlate of, of uh, atrophy patterns in Alzheimer's. And what we found was that no matter what we tried, what combination of genes and the network diffusion model we tried, uh, only the network diffusion model actually is predictive of the patterns of atrophy in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, and for this, reason, uh, this, this purpose, we chose only the, the top genes that are actually known to be involved in Alzheimer's disease from GWAS studies. Um, and so, and what I'm showing you here is the uh, uh, negative log uh, p-value uh, of various uh, uh, predictors in the model. In each case, you see that the prediction, po predictive power is dominated by network diffusion, and uh, none of the uh, gene predictors are super uh, significant. So um, that, that tells you that maybe the network is what's causing or, or is responsible for the patterns that you actually see in disease. And if that is true, uh, we can then take it forward. And because the network diffusion model is, is basically deterministic, uh, why don't I take baseline scan extract the pattern of atrophy in a patient and play out the model for future time points and see if we can predict longitudinal changes in these patients. And, and again, we use the ADNI data set with, which has about two to four years longitudinal follow-up on most subjects. And we published this a couple of years ago and we showed uh, that it works. And here's an example of how it works in Alzheimer's disease where the leftmost glass brain is baseline atrophy and the other two are projections from the model, uh, uh, which is great because you can see that uh, in, in, in all cases, the, uh, the subcortical regions in yellow and the temporal regions in, in red are going to dominate, which are the regions look, we need to look for, uh, if we, if, uh, for, to, for cognitive impairment. So uh, that's great, uh, but we knew that about Alzheimer's. If you're Alzheimer's, we know you have Alzheimer's, so no, no value added. The value added comes when you look at early subjects called mild cognitive impairment, MCI. And I'm to just giving you two illustrative examples. At the top is uh, an MCI subject who converted to AD uh, during the course of the study. And you see that um, on the left there, baseline pattern has a lot of uh, subcortical and temporal atrophy, but perhaps on, at low levels. And this person was rightly projected to turn into uh, full-blown full Alzheimer's 
basically focus on the uh, ellipse because that's where we expect to see cognitive impairment. The interesting thing is that there was a subject who did not convert to AD, and you can see that, yes, at all time points, the, the atrophy gets worse over time, but not in areas we typically associate with cognitive impairment. So this is a way of, of using such deterministic models to uh, do prognosis about a particular patient. We did a whole bunch of statistics on all the data uh, sets available, and we found that uh, we were able to improve the, uh, the, the Pearson's R correlation between predicted atrophy and real atrophy at future time points uh, by a substantial uh, amount. And um, I mean, I just want to point out that this is actually an important clinical application. Uh, because uh, if, you ha if you're an elderly person, uh, it's not sufficient for you to know that you have memory impairment. You want to know what the future holds for you. And, and that's important for the, the patient, but also for their caregivers and also for their physician, because they need to prescribe uh, a tr a tailor treatment planning based on uh, what might happen to them in five years' time. So th this kind of thing can be really very useful in the clinic. So of course, you guys have been to talking about big data science, uh, deep learning, machine learning. Uh, this is the opposite of machine learning, what I just described. Uh, you have a bottom-up model that you project out into the future. You're not using statistics, statistics to learn. However, I feel that uh, um, I think the two are not mutually exclusive. Uh, what you may want to do is something hybrid, and the previous speaker alluded to that. If you know something about the disease, use it and take it as far as you can take it and use machine learning and, and deep learning methods to take it the rest of the way. And, and, and this is the kind of direction I, my lab is really heading into. Uh, we want to basically combine first principle models with the statistical uh, uh, data mining models and come up with something which either of them cannot do by itself. Just to give an example of what first principle models buys you, you can turn the network diffusion backwards and try to infer where the disease may have started. And we published this paper in Brain uh, also this year, where we showed that on the atrophy patterns from pe uh, patients' baselines, we're able to really uh, kind of drill down to and go back in time of uh, these patients and to figure out where the disease comes from. Uh, and this can also have its own clinical relevance, because knowing where the disease came from uh, would tell the neurologist something that they did not know just by looking at the baseline pattern of disease. I'm going to give you one uh, slightly hairy example of how uh, 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 disease modeling, bottom-up modeling, can actually be informed by, uh, by image data. And here I'm going to talk about Smolokowski coagulation theory, which basically uh, was proposed uh, decades ago uh, to, to model how various uh, oligomers kind of co you know, coagulate together to become polymers of bigger and bigger sizes. Uh, and the reason this is relevant is that in all degenerative diseases, uh, we are talking about uh, monomers and soluble oligomers of misfolded proteins that then collect together and become larger and larger until they become tangles and plaques, which then we can see on, uh, uh, in, in the brain. The ability to model this process would be uh, amazing. Uh, but, and, and so Smolkowski, for instance, is one out of many different models. They've been around for a while, but until recently, there's no way, no way to test it on in vivo imaging data. Now that we have it, uh, uh, and here's an, uh, basically what ha seems to happen is a uh, first order differential equation, again, where you talk about how aggregates get together. There's uh, reaction kinetic terms uh, that are unknown. So these are very high dimensional models that can't be fit very easily to real data. Um, but if you collect, uh, combine that with the previously mentioned network diffusion model, now f all, uh, finally we have a way of not only modeling how ag proteins aggregate in regions, but also how they travel around in the whole brain network, so that now you can use tau PET and amyloid PET data coming from uh, actual um, um, scans. And uh, I'm not going to show you. Let's just, let's just say that the model predictions of that combined model uh, seems to agree very well with the patterns of tau PET that we measure from uh, Alzheimer's patients. So um, uh, in the last few uh, minutes remaining, I want to focus on another set of models uh, 
that get to the structure function question in, in computational neuroscience, which is the idea that how does the structural connectivity or the wiring of the brain lead to the functional pattern of activity we see? Uh, and this is a really important question. Uh, and in the past, people have come up with these uh, very hairy couple of differential equations that model the, uh, the neural masses located at each end. And by doing very long simulations, you can obtain a prediction of how that the wiring leads to function. Uh, we thought that was needlessly complex. Uh, and so we came up with a very simple network diffusion model uh, to, to model how uh, activity might spread in the brain. And if you are paying attention, you notice that this model is basically identical to how we were modeling the spread of pathology. Completely different things. But uh, the value of a, of a simple first order model like diffusion is that it is so universally applicable. And again, you can predict functional connectivity at uh, the bottom left from the Laplacian of the structural connectivity. And, and that's uh, like one of the simplest things you can do. Uh, and we were able to show that the parameters of the model fit between structural and functional connectivity actually have clinical relevance. Here's an example of what happens in disorders of consciousness. These are very, very highly uh, traumatic brain injury patients who were almost comatose. And uh, uh, a year later, they, uh, some of them underwent functional recovery. And we were able to show that at baseline, the diffusion time parameter from the model really fits very well. Uh, is a, it's very predictive of uh, one year later functional recovery. So these models can add value to the clinic. Uh, another thing that came out of the structure function uh, um, uh, model was that the eigenvalues of the structural Laplacian and the functional connectivity must be related by, the, uh, by an exponential decay function. And we tested that on real data, and we found that to be the case as shown here. And what this also means is that if you take just a few Laplacian eigenvectors, you can almost basically rebuild the functional connectivity matrix starting from the structural connectivity matrix. And, and that's great because uh, it finally helps you connect structure and function in, in the human brain. Um, so um, in the interest of time, I'll just quickly talk about what I'm planning. Uh, and this is where I need a lot of help from, from you guys if anybody is interested. What I want to do is to use graph theory to turn neurological and pathophysiological knowledge into testable mathematical models. And I think this is a really amazing opportunity that we have now to develop a multimodal tracker of dementia and other degenerative diseases. Um, we want to add machine learning and deep learning, as I mentioned before, and uh, uh, come up with computational biomarkers of neurodegeneration. Using the structure function uh, algorithm for uh, activity, we also want to then uh, introduce the effect of disease. Uh, what does a lesion or a stroke or a, 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 a epileptic seizure do to the functional activity in these, in these brains? And we want to come up with a network dynamic workbench, which is under construction, where you'd just be able to uh, use a browser to go in there and insert your own lesion pattern and see what functional uh, uh, and other uh, consequences of that pattern or on the on the brain would be would lead to. One last thing I want to talk about is that uh, we because now we understand networks, we have the ability to use uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, other stimulation techniques to change that network behavior, and and uh, we want to uh, be able to combine network models with TMS and other uh, stimulation techniques uh, in a way that is efficient. And here I'm thinking about phase array. Uh, uh, set of mini TMS probes. And for this, if there's any electrical engineer out there uh, want to work on this, uh, call designers, please let me know. That would be amazing. Uh, I want to stop here. Thank you. In the interest of time, I will postpone the questions to the panel. We certainly have tons of questions for you. Uh, and I would like to invite Deep Ganguly to uh, start setting up. Um, so um, Deep is a computational biologist at the